All right, guys, welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are joined by Adam Chavez. Now, Adam is a really cool bro. We met actually at the uh, Ed Cauldron Seminar and C- Ed Cauldron and Seer Pick Seminar, learning all about how to pick lock and do all that James Bond stuff. And uh, me and Adam started talking, and I said, Bro, you've got a crazy history, man, and a crazy story. Like, I need to get you on the podcast. And he was kind of reluctant about it at first, but eventually he agreed. I was pressing him a little bit. He said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come on, and I'll see what you guys are about. So we're very appreciative, bro, that you decided to come on here. Um, welcome on to the podcast, first of all. How are you, sir? I'm fantastic. You know, just uh, having a nice Sunday. So you uh, live in the free world of Arizona, if I'm correct. Yes, yes. We we uh, when you cross the border, you get a gun and uh, <laughs> a machine gun, right? You know, no, absolutely. You know, <laughs> only if you can bump fire it. Though. Right, right. So you're uh, you're over there, and what you guys are up to uh, at the moment is you're making. I don't know whether to call them karats or call them escape and evasion bracelets, but they're they're kind of both, aren't they? Well, it's all dependent on how you use it. I mean, if it's strong enough to hold up to three hundred pounds. But it's been strong enough to cut through things. And it's just depending on what your your intent is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like how you're doing that, man. And so what's really cool about these things is um, I'm pulling up a pictures of them here on Instagram to show you guys. But Adam, bro, do you do you have one you could show the, the audience at home? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So this is one of them. The way it looks is just a standard bracelet wrapped around. Secures via magnet. I, I add in roughly about a quarter of an inch to an eighth of an inch at most. I mean, a little to, to most uh, slack to allow there's movement without having gaps in the beads. Um, I try to do patterns that are just, they're just good patterns, good colors, good beads. It's all about the quality of the, obviously, you know, the, the better, more of it looks like jewelry, the less of it is obvious. Yeah, and that's what I really like about these things, to be honest with you, is you would never know that it's a tool uh, just from looking at it. And the really cool thing also about these things is that you've got the tungsten beads on certain ones of these, if I'm correct. Uh, For this one, I do. I'm just trying something out with them. Um, They're more closer to the end. So these beads are tungsten beads versus these are all glass. So these last three, so the thought process is if I have to, I can use it to swing and smack a window. Um, I think the next iteration is going to have them more towards the, the main center. So that way you have a good amount of service area that you can smack everything with. And then um, just standard neodymium, maglock, magnets, uh, Japanese beads, uh, good cord. And what I like about the magnet too is you can you can take it off real quick and you're not gonna bust up your bracelet, you know, and that's I think is smart. And it's relatively quiet as well. So explain to guys real quick the tungsten thing, man. What what's with this? Why does it break glass? How does it break glass? Um, I forget the exact scientific issues with it, but there's something to do with the it's either, I think it's the I'm sorry. It's the it was something to do with the density of the tungsten versus the density of the glass, and then the ability to um, shatter it comes from the massive amount of pressure being put on tiny, tiny pieces. Sounds Basically, yeah. More, yeah. So, sounds right I to me. To be a scientist. I, I, no, I mean I'm the same way. I've heard it explained a million times, but I can never really verbalize it myself. It's it's one of those things that it's like. I know how it works, but I don't really know how it works, you know, but uh, so that was, it was well, more well said than I could have said, to be honest. So, um, Adam, you were a Marine. You, you went through some interesting stuff in the Marine Corps, man. And I, I'll let you kind of get into that, but uh, you didn't start out as a Marine infantry guy. You were saying that you actually, they put you as a radio man at, at first and then, and then things started taking even more interesting turns. So, so what happened with that, man? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I got into boot camp. I was very early. It was like 2010 when I, uh, 2004 when I joined. And it was December. Uh, so the Christmas, first Christmas, obviously, uh, was straight there in boot camp. 
uh, got the boot camp. I went in open contract. Uh, so uh, for those guys who don't know, open contract just means that they choose the job for you based on the needs and your scores. So you could have a really smart guy, you know, as a cook. You could also have a really dumb guy in admin sometimes. It's weird. Um, so I get to my unit. I know. So I go. So I go to out of boot camp. They go to what's called MCT, which is Marine Combat Training. It's basically like a couple weeks of like very summarized uh, combat stuff because you, since you don't have a non a, a non a technically what's called a pogue, um, you're not you're not a grunt, so you don't need all the intensive training with the, all the massive weapon systems. They kind of give you the basic rifleman stuff that you should learn. Um, but then. So I get done with that. They finally give me my MOS. They say, hey, you're a radio guy. So I go to my unit. I go to school, the comm school, and they changed it to a wireman. Uh, for the people who don't know, uh, if you've seen Enemy at the Gates, it's that portion when they're crawling through the dirt and they're getting sniped the whole time. So they yeah, got there, did that, um, got to my unit, uh, kind of got voluntold to go with weapons company. So I had to learn how to be a radio guy, even though I wasn't trained to it um very on the fly uh very your 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 skills are dependent on the lives of the people around you so and the grunts don't normally know not all of them know radio procedures but the ones that do know it you know they expect you to be better than them obviously so then, that's that's a really interesting thing man um now when you say you're a radio were you working on those old, like, portable transceiver things from Vietnam type deal, uh, carrying one on your pack? Or were you, was it, is it, I'm assuming it's more advanced these days. No, it was about that. There was a gist of that. So it was a Prick 119s as the general ones, but then they get them vehicle mounted, which means that they have boosted signal. They get, because we are a weapons platoon, uh, they required heavy guns. So they have Mark 19s, 240s. Um, and 50 cals per the standard. We do the whole business. Um, we're out there, but like I've seen enough videos and movies to kind of figure out like, like don't be the guy with the radio antenna on your back. Plus, they don't really have the same electrical code we do. So there will be guys that'll just string new power lines over old power lines. So you there is very unsafe, obviously, right? And it's not regulated in the same concept. So, and I did, lo we did lose one of our Marines who uh, his antenna smacked the, the wire and basically it fried him. Uh, yeah. So there's, that shit does happen. But, um, so what I did instead was I took a, a smaller radio, a, a, a basically a, a, what would be considered black gear. And we basically, I basically boosted the signal off the truck and used it on my leg and a leg pouch. Huh. Huh. I mean, that's, that's most valuable stuff to know, man. Everyone wants to know, you know, small unit tactics and run around with guns and stuff and do Rambo, but nobody ever bothers to learn how to operate, you know, even a, a simple ham radio, right? Have program freaks into it and all that. So you knowing that stuff is um, pretty, pretty valuable, dude. So you, you went through that. Um, you got assigned to the weapons company. You actually went over to Fallujah. Twice, yes. Twice. First, okay. first time was uh, first time wasn't with weapons. They put me on guard duty, so you're basically watching over the camp. And then we did QRF, so we were like we're yeah. quick reaction force in case, God forbid, something happened, um, which a couple times it did. Um, and then when I went second time, that's when I went with weapons company and got a lot of information. Uh, a lot of weird weird things happen that deployment. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, you, you get these skills, you start learning these things and, uh, you build that camaraderie when, you know, you eat, sleep and shit in the same holes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, man, you, you were telling me some stories and I don't want to, I don't want to bring up old memories, but you, you saw some combat, didn't you? Some close combat. Yeah. 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 In Fallujah, there was, there was a, quite, quite a few times there was some weird shit going on. Um, uh, one time, a uh, the we, we were QRF. Um, the ECP, uh, basically a 500 pound shape charge that was inside of a dump truck, took out an entire clover leaf. Damn. Luckily, and sadly, only one marine died. Every like he literally parked his truck in such a way that 
it up armored the up armored uh seven ton took like 90 percent of the blast and it threw him um like several hundred feet wow wow we were talking about one of ed's courses where you um learn how to learn how to use a knife and, and basically you kind of related to me that you might have you might have had to done that over overseas at one point yeah that that happens um sometimes yeah. Shit happens and it's not pretty. Um, but I mean, a knife is a tool. It does one thing. It cuts. Now, depending on what you use it on, that how it, that's what it's going to be cutting. Yeah. So, um, do you think that the training that you received as you know as a as a marine kind of prepared you for combat, or or was was it does that- it does it? But then, but the the mechanics of it it helps you but it doesn't tell you the toll that you're going to have to pay later in yeah. reference to whether or not psychologically you'll be able to handle things that you see over there, do over there or uh, witness in general. Yeah. That's, that's what all the guys I've met like yourself who have really seen some shit kind of say is that, you know, you, you, you go through it and you do what you have to do, but it's, um, there's a price to pay for it. Right. Like everything else. So, Absolutely. Yeah. What would you say to guys out there, younger guys than yourself, maybe even guys who are currently in, um, you know, who, who might be struggling a little bit, dealing with some shit? I mean, what, is there a light on the other side of the tunnel? Well, one, you have to either logically or illogically tell yourself how, like, this is something that happens. It's not something you choose. It's not like you're out there, you know, hunting for the person personally, but I mean, there are some cases where people are looked for and that's, that's a whole different situation, but you have to understand that you're going to, if you go down that route, you don't want to, you don't want to deal with that. That's not something that, you know, I know guys who have night terrors. I know guys who, you know, they, uh, they don't ever get sleep in general. It's just, it's how you live through it. Yeah. Yeah. I've known a few guys like that myself, man. It's, it's gotta be really tough, but you know, it you guys do it and the rest of us are very grateful that that we didn't have to do it and that you guys did it you know for us so to speak but i mean now you you see man like honestly i would never have known that that you were this ex-marine guy but you you're just so different well, than most marines dude yeah well marines are never exes it's a weird situation marines if, you, if you're like well, Marines are never ex-Marines. Even right. if they were a shitty Marine, they were still a Marine. So, like, case in point, uh, Full Metal Jacket pulls it up in, in the best way to explain it. Um, the Lee Harvey Oswald, when he shot Kennedy, they said Marine Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm. Whenever something, whenever we're in the, the, in the headlines, they always state Marine. That person was a Marine. They, they don't, when they do soldiers or Navy or Air Force or... They say ex military, ex marine, ex army, ex navy, ex. It's it's a weird thing. We don't we don't ever stop being marines. Well, you guys are the. I mean, you guys are the best warriors I've ever I've ever met, man. And I've, I've met a lot of guys, but the, the finest warriors I've ever trained with have all been marines, dude. I mean, the, the whatever, however they make you guys, they're making you guys the right way. So. You're also a knife reviewer, man. You you build knives, um, and you review knives. So tell tell us a little bit about that part of your your business here i it's well, not really a business more of a hobby for that aspect i just like i won't well, well, i love knives number one in general it's just a you can't open a potato chip bag with a glock it doesn't look right <laughs> but um i just i've seen a lot of guys when i'm in my unit they'd buy knives and waste money and they get some cheap stuff and they you know the dragon killer 5000 or <laughs> you know the slay master or you know, in some places, you know, they get like a knife that's woefully overtasked for the situation. Like they're getting a smatch it, which is going to go on your vest, which is like half the vest. <laughs> right. Like it yeah. makes no sense. Well, you need, you need like two machetes on your vest. Right. And then like a couple yeah. of knives on your belt. Otherwise you're just an amateur. So. <laughs> if I don't look like Danny Trejo from fucking Desperado, I'm doing it wrong. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So tell, I mean, tell us, man, like now it's funny because you, here you are, you're, you're a Marine, 
you're going through these courses still, man, you're, you're always training, but you're, you're sitting behind a desk at the same point. Is it frustrating to you to not be a man of action these days or, or what? Well, no, I mean, like I said, I bounce on the weekends, number one, but, um, I consider it like, it's like putting a gun in a gun safe. Like you pull it out once in a while, but like, you also notice like there are fights that are worth fighting for, but there's a lot of bullshit out there. That's not even worth it. Like, why are we fighting over this? Like, why are you getting mad about certain things that are trivial when there's real shit happening? Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent, man. And there's a lot of that going around right now, but, uh, you know, the world we live in is a crazy place, which is why I started gutter fighting secrets, man. It's, it's not so much a business for me. It's, it's more of a, like you said, a hobby like yourself, but at the same point, there there is a lot of serious shit going on in the world today, man. I mean, whether you look oh, yeah. at the geopolitics of things or even domestically, and we won't get too much in, down that rabbit hole, but like, you know, people need to know how to defend themselves and take care of themselves. Um, and over the last two, three years, it's become more evident than ever before. I, what, what do you say about that, man? I mean, people out there, look at the look at the guys and girls we were in the seminar at Ed Cauldron's thing, man. Like, there was a lot of, like, ex-military guys and different guys, cops, firefighters. But then there's a lot of people who are just normal, everyday people. I mean, you notice mm -hmm. that I'm well uh, as well, I'm sure, that people are really looking to defend themselves these days. Well, here's the problem is that the, the fight has stopped becoming uh, – how do I put this? It's – it's we're, we're not it, it, whatever side you're on of anything none of it's a traditional war there's no traditional uh there, there's not like oh it's the blue side against the red side there's a there's a definitive amount of people who have chosen this and and in general uh especially with some of these groups that are out there nowadays uh it's very guerrilla warfare types but the concept is basically blending in being in plain sight being you know, as Ed says, the zebra among zebras. Hmm. Yeah, I like looks for a zebra among zebras. Yeah. No, it's it's very true, man. And it's it's very true. I mean, you could even go as far as to say that the war we're fighting now is more of an informational war, more of an intelligence. To use a cool buster more. It's um, you know, it, it really is. But no matter what, and here's the thing, man. Pick a side, don't pick a side. We're all we're all we're all fighting every day in, in some respect. Right. Which is why I think that it is so important that no matter who you are, or what you believe, you, you learn the skills and abilities to defend yourself, whether that's in an argument with a coworker, you know, and you don't want to get psychologically bullied or whatever. Like or if it's, you know, you're walking down, you live in a shitty neighborhood and you need to watch your back. You need to know how to defend yourself. And I mean, I'm Absolutely. sure you're all about that just from just from the guy I know that I've talked to so far, you seem like you know your shit and it seems like you're, you're kind of on that same page as us here that you want to help people. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that you can give people the tools, but if they don't have the intent, so a lot of like, I, I think it's hilarious in this time and age where there's a lot of people who are like, well, I want to get a gun and they're not getting a gun out of necessity. They're getting a, a gun out of fear. And half the time it's a fear about having a gun, knowing everybody else has a gun. Um, at the start of COVID, uh, I went to go pick up, uh, I, think it was, I think I was just picking up ammo. And there's a lady in line and she, she's like, oh yeah, I'm just going to buy a Glock and then I'm going to return it once COVID is over. <laughs> like that, like, I was like, what? Like, no, don't, why? Why even be here then? Because that means you have, no, you, you have no intent to use it. Right. Not to say that like anybody should have the intent, but it's a fire extinguisher. It's better to have it, not need it, and not have it. Yeah, no, it is, and it's funny, you know. I I know a lot of people out here on the East Coast who are always adamantly against firearms, and nobody should have them. And then as soon as stuff starts happening, you know, they're calling you up. Hey, can I borrow something? Like, no, that's not the way it works. You, this is illegal. I can't do that. I'm sorry, you were against this in the first place, or they're going and they're, they're trying to buy one only to realize in the state that we live in, you got to get a permit from the freaking police department. You got to wait six months. Yeah. Before you got it, all this stuff. Like, I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. You were against this. Like what changed your mind? Oh, now you're fearful. So you want an insurance policy, right? But Hey, it's better. I think personally 
Adam, to, to have those people kind of start to realize that the world we live in is not candy canes and unicorns. Um, you know, cause I think it does, it does affect a positive change on people's cycle, psycho, psychological, right. Psychology. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, to, yeah, to realize all this stuff. So tell us about the lock picking, man. What got you, what got you into lock picking? Um, well, I mean, it's, uh, part of it's nerdy. I just, uh, other part of it is I like puzzles, locks or puzzles. That's yeah. all they are. Um, but part of it's nerdy, like, you know, fucking play D and D once in a while, you know, <laughs> I was end up playing a rogue. So I was like, yes, let's just do this. <laughs> Plus at the same time, it's a super useful skill to have that yeah. like not a lot of people have. Yeah. I mean, for yeah. sure. Like, I don't know if you've ever found yourself at the gym and someone locks their stuff out of their locker or someone's locked themselves mm-hmm. out of their vehicle. And you're like, Oh, I'm the guy. Here you go. I always end up being the guy. for some yeah. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> have you ever, um, have you ever really gotten like a satisfying door pop or a satisfying lock pop that, I mean, there's a good story behind it. You, you just, that was, that was it. Like, um, so far this one is, a so this is a, out here we have what's called the, um, it's a, power company called APS and my friend found one it's an old brass lock super well like beaten but very heavy dense um he tried to high heaven with this one it's got a huge keyhole uh keyway in there so like you can't just put a standard uh a standard tension wrench in there and it you know he said I tried it I tried it I tried it I tried it and uh we're just we're just bullshitting I'm like all right I'm done and he was just like and there's no there's no give. Like if you're playing with the master locks, they have they have some. There's some wiggle room here, right? You can feel the lock. You can feel the plug moving a little bit. You can feel the tumbler, not the tumbler, but the pins, you know, up and down. Super stiff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is like a beginner lock for some people, but it was something that was like, oh well, he couldn't get it, and I ended up getting it. Nice. That's. I mean, that's such a satisfying feeling too, especially when it's that type of thing. Like, oh, like. My body couldn't get it, but I got it. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm that good. <laughs> and um, it's it's such a it's like we said, it's such a useful skill, but it's such a skill that requires an enormous amount of patience. Are you the type of individual with patience, or do you say it teaches you patience? I think it teaches you patience only because uh, how do I put this? Like, I could totally put a key in this. Like here, and the thing is, is, one, I'm trying to do it to a point where I don't need a key. Like I can just do it in a matter of seconds. Right, right. I want to, I, I want to be able to, if I, if I get locked out, I want to be able to get into my, my house within a matter of seconds by just using a quick skill that I picked up. And, um, you know, sometimes seconds is, seconds is life. So there's that. Um, the other part of it is just, uh, if, uh, sorry, give me, if you, if you don't practice it and you lose it and, and that's like, I started combing with one hand just to see if I could comb a mm. lock with one hand, like lock and comb all in one hand, just so I can, you know, you never know you might, it's weird. You know, you never know if you're not going to have the use of that hand. Who knows? I might have to hold my gun at the same time while yeah. picking a lock. No, it's very true. It's very true. Um, or even, you know, and I know it's unrealistic, but you know, I don't, you know. I don't think so. To be honest with you, man, I mean, you, you could be holding a number of items, right. Or holding a person, yeah. you know, talk about EP details, right. Executive protection. I know you get armed security as well. You might be holding on to your client in a dark room to make sure that you got a firm grasp on them and you maybe need to get into somewhere else. Right. You never know. That's a, that's a viable, feasible situation. So it's, it's the type of thing that I, I find myself always telling myself I need to practice this. And then I'm just letting my skills get rusty here. Uh, but I admire your fortitude at actually going ahead and keeping sharp on this. All the guys I've ever met who are good at this, like literally practice almost every day. Yeah. That's pretty much what I do at work. I'll, I'll have my locks out in front of me and I'll just sit there, pick one up, start picking it, uh, get a, you know, get some calls in, take that call, put it down, put it back up. Uh, well, I, you know, sometimes while I bounce, if, uh, if it's a slow night, I'll just walk around, 
you know, I'll keep this in one hand and just watch people. Because uh, from the from what Matt said at the class is a lot of it's feel. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be able to, you know, what's the point of me looking at a plug the whole time? I'm going to look at the, It's like looking at an asshole. You're just looking at it the whole time. You're not going any deeper. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you might as well just, okay, just don't look at it. Do the feel, get the feel. And then it's just a matter of seconds. Tell us about bouncing. And do you think that, um, do you think that that kind of teaches you some good kind of lessons about human behavior and whatnot, self-defense? Once human behavior, another one's just body language. Another one is, but you also have to realize when you're dealing with this, you know, alcohol is a deceptive uh, drug uh, for some so. people. Uh, just in mannerisms, um, uh, you know, people might, you know, for one second, it'd be a split second of them switching, uh, switching mm -hmm. gears to a, to a more aggressive stance. Uh, other times, like I've seen girls shit face like off their fucking mind after we you know, once we kick them out and but right, right when the uber comes stone sober looking hmm. because ubers don't have to pick you up if you're drunk uh -huh. and if you puke in the uber they have to shut down that specific uber for the rest of the night so you can get detailed and that person is charged a hefty sum hmm. for puking in the uber yeah that makes sense it really does um so it, it probably teaches you a lot about not only, like you said, human psychology, body language, um, but it probably gives you some good lessons on kind of, you know, street self-defense, how to read if someone's about to throw a punch, right? How to read. Oh, if yeah. Someone, yeah. Yeah. Tell, oh, yeah. tell us a little bit about, about, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it before, right? What are some tells? What are some pre-fight indicators, to use a fancy word, that you've seen used? Uh, they, they, well, a lot they, of guys are drunks, yeah. so they they kind of telegraph a lot when they're drunk. And most guys that are inexperienced in drinking and fighting at the same time, uh, they they usually telegraph, and you'll you'll see their stance square up. You'll see them, you know, fists at their side. You'll notice the demeanor on their face uh, because they're drunk. They have their blood flow is going to be a little differently, so you, it's going to be harder harder to hide certain emotions in their face um you'll see obviously and then at the same time it gives you time to uh, maneuver with other people that are in security to get around the person to get it taken care of in a pretty much de-escalated manner uh usually the rule of thumb i give people is i give them a ask tell make first i ask you i give you that chance to walk out on your own have that dignity and then i tell you and if that doesn't work it's quickly to make and if it's gotten to make, I've given you more than enough chances to leave. What kind of, what kind of, I mean, are you guys doing like specific holds that they teach you or is it just kind of drag them by the neck and get them out? Well, unfortunately, no, you can't just drive them by the neck. Uh, there's too many people that get uh, lawsuits on that basis and put the liability in. Generally, the rule of thumb is obviously do, uh, you know, as little force as necessary. Um, basically, an escalation of force, right? You never... Never, ex never go two steps above them. Always try to stay like above, uh, like escalate to where they're at. And then once they back down, then you back down to where they're at kind of just incrementally. Yeah. But generally uh, it's usually tag teams. We're usually, you know, grabbing arms. We're usually, you know, just under hooking the arm, walking them out. Um, if they're being really uh, questionable, um, sometimes it's just, all right, you know, we'll get you outside and usually they're, you know, hey, man, let me talk to you real quick. What well, I got to tell you, the music's really loud. So let me talk to you outside. So walk them outside. All right. So now you're outside the club. I'll let you know. I can't let you back in. Blah, blah, blah. This is why. And, you know, I'm five foot five. So I have no, I am not threatening whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Except to guys like me. I've seen it too many freaking times, bro. You, you, you smaller guys. I don't want to mess with you all because you're tough. Well, right? and the well, and the whole time I just talk with a smile. I don't, I have no malice, no anger. I'm just trying, hey, let's do this. Well, that's one thing that makes you very unique as far as, uh, you know, it, combat vet. Like, bro, honestly, most of the guys I've met that are, that are, have your credentials and your credibility, they're, they may be nice, but you, you are very, you're very non threatening. I'll give you that. Very deceptive. Well, well everybody's, uh, you know, it's like the Mike Tyson quote, you know, everybody has a plan until so you get popped in the mouth. Yeah. Ain't that the truth? Unfortunately, I'm 5'5", so everybody tries to fight me. So I'm used to getting popped in the mouth. 
Yeah. Well, that's, that's it, man. That's guys like you are always, always getting into scraps. And so I try to steer the other way whenever I can. It's, uh, it's just a, a old, older guy's wisdom. You know, I don't think we're probably around the same age. So um, you also worked armed security. Uh, yeah. You were saying that you one of the armed security gigs you had was in a homeless shelter, and at that time you yeah. had a few interesting lessons. Can you elaborate? Uh, on that? Yeah. So you're, one, you're dealing with a homeless shelter, so you're dealing with a myriad of issues. You're dealing with mental issues, obviously financial issues, um, and you're also yeah, so which which brings you know desperateness and the fact of survival. Uh, you know, it's that, it's that classic. You know, you never want to be around a, a drowning person because they'll pull you under. So in that aspect, uh, you know, you get that desperation and they'll take you down with them just to get, you know, just to get ahead a little bit, which is nothing wrong. It's survival. It's their instincts kicking in. Um, but you're also dealing with a lot of addiction issues. You're dealing with a lot of people that um, prey on those addiction issues in those areas. You're also dealing with a lot of human trafficking in its own sense. You know, you know, old hookers, that, you know, that's their only their only means of income is is laying down, and, you know, taking the business. Yeah. Yeah. but it's uh deal with that and you learn to, and what's the same thing you have to learn to empathize with people everybody has their own struggle you don't know their struggle you don't know what led them to that whole situation not saying you have to agree with it not saying you you, you should agree, agree with it you just treat them like people they all have their own issues and generally the just a simple act of treating them like a human does you dividends because mm -hmm. you know they get shit on by society in general yeah yeah. And it, it's too bad, man. You know, um, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it's the Christian thing to do to ch try to help one another, one another whenever possible and treat everyone kind of on the, on the same level, uh, whenever possible too. So, so armed security bouncer, um, Marine <sighs> right now, you know, doing desk work, but also on the side doing, um, survival gear so to speak and um also in fact an amateur photographer what led you down that path oh well, you know i saw all these pictures of people taking pictures of their knives and i like photography and i started playing around with it and you know everybody has their own shtick which is fine you know not everybody's anvil adams and not everybody's you know you know a painter like georgia o'keefe you know but in the same sense you uh you start creating your own style your own looks your own aesthetics and you can start to figure out who made took that picture i like playing around with the, you know focus and i like playing around with a lot of uh just the layout in general uh you know playing with a lot of different uh techniques and a lot of it's just self-taught like you just you know if it looks good it looks good you don't have to know the technical aspect of it but if it looks good it looks good no, absolutely. It, and you can always tell somebody who's trying <clears throat> and somebody who kind of knows what they're doing and then somebody who's yeah. just pointing their iPhone and clicking away. Do you think um, the Marine Corps made you a better photographer? In other words, every Marine a rifleman, right? So do you think shooting yeah. helped you learn how to shoot? Um, in a sense, and most of the time, I just try to figure out, like, what is the what is your message you're trying to convey? Hmm. And like, you know, if, if a photo comes out very flat, generally it doesn't have a message or it's just a very bland message. You want something like, it's hard to take a picture of something that's very stagnant and uh, inanimate and make it feel like there's an, uh, you know, animation to it in a sense. Like yeah. there's some movement and play and, you know, let your eye and how your eye dances across it. It is so true, man. I mean, it, that's really where the skill comes in because Yes, you can watch uh, TikToks about how to take better pictures with your iPhone and you can play around with the different settings on your iPhone. But when you're talking about, you know, using a real camera, taking a picture of an inanimate object and telling that story, having, conveying, making that into art is a way different skill set than, like you we were saying, you know, pointing and clicking an iPhone. So, you know, that's, that is a fascinating um kind of hobby and maybe at some point what do you think more than a hobby uh well i don't know if you know about cameras they're expensive <laughs> it's not even the cameras it's the lenses the lenses are really get you some of these lenses are like they're more than my mortgage several times 
That's pretty crazy, man. I, I actually did not know how expensive the lenses were, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and you have you have regular lenses, you have hobbyist lenses, and then you got those, you know, professional lenses with the glasses. Like it's it gives you such a great picture, but then you're paying like, you know, grands for it, you know, like there's like there's some lenses out there I've seen that have to have their own tripod just for the lens, not the actual camera itself. Yeah. The lens has a support because it sticks out so much and it's so heavy and it's to the body ratio and it also keeps from you know the camera from wiggling and which translates into the picture itself. Uh, I didn't didn't even think about that to be honest. I know that photography is actually one of those soft skills that I mean they teach it in you know the CIA for example when you go through the the farm they they teach yeah clandestine photography right so it's its own skill set its own right. Definitely is. Definitely is. Um, I spent some time as a PI and that was kind of a big thing. I mean, how do you, you know, how do you get good footage and keep the camera still and not make it look like shit? And, you know, even sometimes play around with how do you get the the person or the thing that you want to photography that you want to take a picture of without getting too much of the background. And, you know, even if you really get into it, right. Like how do you get inside a, uh, windshield of a car you know it's like the reflection is is there Polarized lens. the trees yeah yeah exactly or you get you play around with the f-stops right that too yeah yeah it's uh it's it's there's a lot to it man so um what's next for you man are you are you gonna are you gonna start really getting more into the 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 bracelets here are you thinking about branching off into a little bit other you know gear uh more E and E stuff. You mentioned that you're going to do a giveaway soon on the IG page. Yeah, my Instagram page. Uh, starting October 29th, it's going to go all the way from my birthday to the Marine Corps birthday. So it's going to go from October 29th till November 10th. Nice. And uh, you know, let everybody get in. It's going to be one one person per obviously entry. Uh, simple like, uh, follow for all the people that are joining in on it because they're. There's a few different makers that have donated stuff of their own. Um, I got some, I got a key bar that has my logo in it, uh, that key bar that's uh, made for the, for the giveaway. I have uh, a handkerchief with my logo in it coming. I have a couple of stickers with that. Then I also have like, uh, the, uh, there's going to be a garage with it. There's going to be, and that's going to be of the winner's choice uh, from, you know, colors and stuff. Nice. Because it's kind of more, of a, it's more of a personal item. I can't just, you know, hey, here's a garage. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a couple different stuff from uh, Loyalty uh, Supply Co. There's going to, which is some handkerchiefs and some shop rags. There's going to be some sear pick, um, pick set with uh, stickers. There is going to be a, so I got that sear pick. There might be something from Vice Hardware. Um, I haven't hashed it out with them. Um, there's another female. Her name's Stabby Cunt. I know it sounds weird, but she's got a knuckle duster that has a razor blade on the end of it. Oh, cool. Uh, she's donating. Um, there's a couple of other small here. Oh, KPL, Knife Pivot Lube. They sent a complete care kit. So you can lube up your knives. You can clean them. Uh, maintain, your, ma maintain your gear. You know, it's not just about having the cool gears, knowing how to maintain them. Mm. Uh, there's a very old uh, bead from Santi, who's a th uh, he's in Thailand. He makes really great beads. Um, so those are usually rare and hard to find, or they take a while. Uh, there is what else we got going on? I think there's like one or two more things. Oh, I might be getting a knife from a different maker as well. Nice. Um, I get to be announced. I have to get. It. I I don't really put it out until I get the actual uh, product in my hand. Not to say that the makers aren't going to do it, but, you know, shit happens. There's also probably going to be some stuff from Gutter Fighting Secrets. Um, There's that, too. There's that, that, too. So, yeah, awesome, man. Uh, listen, guys, at Flippin' Bean, okay? At Flippin' Bean on Instagram. F-L-I-P-I-N. B-E-A-N. Okay, link's going to read right down below here. Uh, follow, all right? Like, subscribe. Share all that stuff. What is it? What is the rules of the giveaway again? Basically, it's going to be like and follow. So you have to like the, the post itself, the initial post, and follow everybody that's in the giveaway themselves. Um, okay. If anything, it's going, to, it's going to put people on gear they didn't know that was out there. 
Um, there is going to be a caveat. If you want extra entries, you can. Uh, all you would need to do is you would donate to either uh, the Raider Project, which is a Marine Special Operations uh, uh it helps out with the families of fallen uh, raiders, which are the uh, you know Marsoc guys, uh, and then or you can do and that's any denomination that you do yourself. All I have to see is somehow you have to show me proof that you made the donation, and that can be done via screenshot. You don't have to show me the financials. I just have to be able to see what was you know taken care of. Or you could also donate to um, our Santa Muerte, which is a local Santa Muerte temple. That is just, uh, you know, they're, they're offering to the community help. They're just trying to, you know, keep their, you know, keep the doors open. Nice. Very nice. I like what you're doing there, man. It's, um, it's, it's good shit. It really is. So I forgot to mention, guys, he, um, Adam, not only does he do uh, these bracelets in one color. You guys saw the purple bracelet, right, with the um, tungsten beads. You do bracelets in almost every conceivable variety of colors. And if a guy or girl out there wants a specific custom thing, you'll do that as well, right? Yep. I've done Skeletor. I've done a Mega Man themed one. I've done a Boba Fett and Mandalorian themed. Um, I've also done, let's see what else was there. I did one I call it the Purple Rain and Rise of Your Prince. Nice. Uh, it's a lot of purple, a lot of gold. Um, else is there i've done a for one guy i did a uh, black panther i've also done a different version of the skeletor which has been apparently nicknamed the cotton candy so it's got a lot of teals a lot of different like uh think lisa frank i know that's gonna age us but in that aspect of those colors um but yeah i mean i just if you have a pattern or a color you prefer the only caveat i have on that is if I know another maker makes that pattern, I don't do it. Go okay. to that maker. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So, and there have been people who have asked me for certain makers, and I just said, hey, go to him. Go to her. Yeah. No, that's very fair, and I admire that. I mean, it takes, it takes uh, accountability for sure. I think it would be fascinating, man. So I'm a fireman, and we do a lot of vehicle extrication drills. Um, and we are able to get our hands on vehicles a lot. So I'd love to grab one of these from you one day take the tungsten beads and take it to a window and film it, and, you know, okay. see what damage we could cause. And, uh, you know, if that's ever something that would interest you or that you'd be down for, just let me know. I'd love to get it done. So yeah, we can definitely cool. do that. Cool. All right, man, Adam, I, I really appreciate you coming on here, bro. It's been a fucking pleasure. And, um, absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely good to talk. Definitely good to, to get to know you guys out there and, um, keep it free, bro. I will. Thank you. You have a great night. Yeah, no, you too. And uh, we'll be in touch. Guys, until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast. <laughs>